Let's look at Proverbs chapter 6. This is the passage that we opened with this morning. And uh, our word for today fits so perfectly well with this particular illustration brought out in the scripture that I... Uh, I couldn't ignore it. I know we have even spoken about this passage of Scripture before. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6, uh, reading all the way down through verse um, 11, uh, or through that passage, talks about the ant and how God actually encourages us to look at the, the way an ant acts. And we'll read it again, just for the context. But the Bible says in Proverbs, Go to the ant, you sluggard. I can use the NIV words. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler. Yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. And then there's that challenge that comes out in verse 9. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a bandit, and scarcity like an armed man. When we consider in Scripture that we have a lot of uh, admonition throughout of men who were challenged to do the work that God wanted them to do, we see that there is a temptation which uh, lies there in the background that says, I want to be, and here's our word for today, lazy. Heavy duty laziness. When uh, you think of the word lazy, I've brought up a few points in the message this morning just to help us focus on it. And uh, the first thing is, I think we're all lazy when it comes to some things. We all have a tendency about us to be lax uh, uh, when it comes to particular areas of our life. On the other hand, there are some areas in our life we're very diligent. In fact, sometimes that can be a, a bone of contention between you and someone else in your household. You may have a particular uh, itch to do something like uh, I've, I've known men who had a, a, a real passion about washing their cars, you know. And I mean, just as soon as it hit the drive, they were back to washing it. And yet, there are other things in the house that they just don't have any uh, passion about whatsoever, you know. And they can go great lengths of time without touching them. And so, uh, uh, and then of course you get a wife who has a passion about something and, uh, and it's opposite to her husband and there's the discussions which take place in the home uh, between them as to, you know, wanting to adjust those uh, passions to where they're somewhere uh, like a compromise between the two. So, you know, when the pile of dirty clothes gets so high you can't get into the bedroom, maybe it's time to do the wash, you know. Or, or uh, maybe when the pillowcase is so sticky you can't get your head off of it, maybe it's time to throw it. You know, yeah, that's right. When the bed bugs get big enough to where you can see them. <laughs> But uh, there is, uh, in the scripture, an emphasis placed upon, obviously, important things to God, which could very easily go without our attention uh, in this life. I, I say this because I feel a particular challenge. I, I think of you as a church, and I have a responsibility as a minister to consider your needs and to consider what God would have you hear uh, from his word or have me emphasize for you. But I also, alongside of that, always think about my own life and how I'm functioning as an individual 
rather than just a ministry. And I carry uh, with myself a constant reminder, asking myself as if I could, I could, you know, rib myself, uh, put the elbow in my own ribs and say, hey, John, what are you doing about this? And I want to be honest. I want to bring this as an opportunity to share with you something on my heart. Um, you will all know from some years ago how that I felt very prompted by the Lord to consider looking at ministry into Mongolia. And uh, with the ultimate goal of seeing about reaching these people uh, in the south of Siberia and Tuva, who had, I thought, very little Christian ministry and and what Christians there were there could really use our support. And uh, I felt that. I want to go back to the beginning. I felt that personally. And so I was reluctant to consider that as a church we would have anything much to do uh, as a ministry with reaching them. And so when I originally approached the leadership team with this opportunity to go to Mongolia, I was asking the leadership team for some time off. I just really wanted uh, the leadership team to say, yeah, John, it's okay for you to go and consider what the Lord would have you do in this area of ministry. And it was a surprise. I'm honest, being honest with you, it was a surprise to me, and of course an overwhelming uh, joy to hear that the leadership team at that time were completely supportive. And to my utter surprise, in the church meeting, when Adrian got up, he said, I think we should send him. As a church, and suddenly as a church, you got on the, 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 the support aspect of that whole mission outreach. And, uh, and I was overwhelmed by that. And of course, the Lord has done some things. Well, most of you will know I intend to go back in June, and it'll be my third and final journey probably to Tuva, because uh, my visa runs out. Maybe at some point the Lord will you know, allow us to to look at going back and doing something more there, but I really feel that this is, we've done what we could. We will continue to support them in prayer and, and communication, but as far as my presence there, it's not as important. And so I've been praying recently, already looking ahead, looking beyond June, and I said, Lord, what's next? What do, and I'm not saying about uh, the church. I'm very, very protective to say the church, we, as a church, you know, we, we need to be protected, but what Lord, what do you want me to do? I believe you want me to be involved in telling others about Christ and being supportive of others in foreign fields. Lord, what would you put on my heart? And without going into detail, I've uh, felt a, a prompting here and there uh, about uh, you know what I think may be on the horizon, and I'm at that prayer point to where I'm praying about seeing if maybe that will be the next thing. Uh, but I say that because I am using myself as an example. We should all do that. Truthfully, we should all consider, Lord, what, would you, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do to try to help propagate the gospel? I'm not talking about saying that it's necessarily in a foreign land. Um, you know, it may be on the other side of the road. Or maybe if you live in East Chestnut, it's in West. Or if you live in the West, it might be in the East might be in, you know, someplace close by. It may just be your neighbors, maybe the apartment block across the way, maybe uh, the street next to yours, someplace where you feel, I need to reach out. I have a burden for that area. I've heard families say this. I've actually heard families who have looked out the window. In fact, uh, you know, when you do your washing up, some of you have, a window in the front, and you can see what's going on in the neighborhood. It's quite entertaining, really, sometimes, you know, when you're doing the washing up, to see what everybody's doing. And I've heard of people say, the Lord put a particular family on my heart, because I, I see them all the time when I'm doing the washing up, always outside, always doing that. And I keep thinking, you know, what are they like? And, and, and what needs do they have? And occasionally I see the interaction between the parents and the children, I see the dad uh, maybe give a hug to the child, and I say, oh, that's nice, you know. Or I'll see the mom scold the kids, and I say, mm, you know. And uh, whatever, you watch life go on. The Lord can put things on your heart, and you can begin thinking, I want to do something about them. I want to consider what the Lord would have me do to see about 
influencing them or sharing the gospel with them or inviting them to church or, or just communicating with them and, uh, and somewhere in there being a Christian to them, you know, baking them a cake, welcoming them to the neighborhood if they're new neighbors or whatever it would take. I say all of that because we have this sense that is natural to us, that holds us back from doing anything. It is laziness. And the longer that it goes, the more heavy duty it becomes. The more difficult it becomes to come out and do anything outside of your doors. It becomes very heavy. The word which is used here in um, Proverbs 6 for sluggard um, is actually a Greek word called um, akneros, akneros. And it has these definitions, slothfulness, being a sloth. Uh, I love the word sluggishness because it reminds me of a slug. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? just kind of has that. I don't, I don't have any idea. Don't look it up in the Oxford to see if it has anything, you know, in the root. But it does sound that way. Just kind of, you know, very sluggish or slug-like, you know. And there, there is a sense of it. But there is another part of it, actually, that surprised me. Part of that definition includes the word backward. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard this illustrated, but in my Christian life, I've heard several ministers through the years who have highlighted the fact that as a Christian, if you aren't moving forward, you are moving backwards. Because a Christian cannot stand still. It is impossible for you to not uh, move and just to remain in the same place. As a Christian, you will either be moving forward or moving backward. If you aren't moving backward, then you are. Or sorry, if you aren't moving forward, then you are moving backward. Because life goes on. The clock continues to tick. You cannot get off the world as much as I have, I have friends occasionally. I just want to get off the world, you know, get off the globe here and just pause because everything's going stark raving mad. And, uh, and you can't do that, however. The clock continues to tick for every minute of our life that goes on. So to stand still means we are moving backwards. But if we move forward, then we will take an offensive effort and, uh, and we will move forward in doing what God wants to do. I don't have it in my notes, but there's a verse in the, in the Bible, and maybe you've heard it many times. But it, it talks about the gates of hell not prevailing against the church. Have you heard that verse? Yes, I have. It's a good verse. The gates of hell not prevailing against the church. But there's an interesting context to that that many people miss. You see, the gates of hell are not offensive, are they? Gates don't move. They don't do anything. They just sit there. So the gates of hell not prevailing against the church. You can't picture some kind of transformer gates who are coming at the church. You know, I mean watching too much children television, you know. You, you're not, you can't picture some animate object like a gate moving aggressively towards the church and the church taking up a great defensive shield to ward off the attacking gates of hell. Do you know what I mean? This doesn't make sense. That's not a picture you can draw. So what that means is the gates of hell will not prevail means the church is charging the gates of hell. Do you see? The gates of hell cannot keep you out. Now you might say, for, well, hang on a minute. If I'm part of the church, why don't I want to get into hell in the first place? I mean, that's not a place I want to go. Oh, yes, it is. If you want to rescue somebody. If you want to pull somebody out of the gates of hell, believe me, if, it, if you're a parent and it was your child, is there anything that would hold you back from getting through those gates? No. Oh, I want to get through those gates and I'm going to rescue my child and there is nothing that's going to hold me back. Well, we have in the scripture the actual uh, promise that the gates of hell 
cannot keep you out. Isn't that cool? You gotta wake up. This is exciting because the gates of hell can't prevail against the church. And yet, how many in the church stand outside the gates of hell and never even push on them? Because they don't just make any effort. We just let the gates of hell keep us out because we don't do anything about getting in. This is the heavy-duty laziness. God gives us the power. I'll say this word, and uh, talking about spiritual things, God gives us the weapons that we need to defeat the enemy. And what we often do with them is we dust them off, we shine them up, and we hang them on the wall. It's so sad. We dust them off. We shine them. Oh, they look pretty. And then we hang them on the wall. I was watching this week a documentary about Air Force One. Do you know what Air Force One is? That's the airplane that uh, the President of the United States has flown around in. And I got interested somehow. I was watching something where they showed Air Force One. And I, I started thinking, you know, I always see the pictures of the outside. I wonder what the inside looks like. And so I went to YouTube and I started scanning through. And sure enough, there were a few documentaries about, you know, touring Air Force One. And, uh, and I, was, I found it intriguing, you know, going through and seeing the president's quarters and all of this. But when they interviewed the uh, staff who look after Air Force One, they have a particular um, sense of ownership. And, of course, they all recognize it's the president's plane. But they would say, you know, but it's my baby. You know, I look after it. And I, you know how the engines are on the wings? I'm not educating you on that. You know, the round tur turbine engines. And just about the lip in the front of them is always that shiny chrome, you know. And, and you've seen it even if you ride EasyJet. They've got that, you know. But there's... there. <laughs> Sorry, there's no comparison there. Ryanair and Air Force One, you know. <laughs> But they have that little lip of chrome. There are actually maintenance people who work on Air Force One. Those are their responsibility. And every time it lands, they get out their cloth and they buff it up and shine it up to make sure that it all looks the best. And this is their responsibility. And I think, you know, that not that a bit over the top? But there is this sense that this piece of equipment protects you know, uh, arguably the most powerful man on earth. And they want to make sure it, it's in good working order. But what if, what if all they did was shine it up and it never flew? What if all they did was make sure they could, you know, see themselves and pick their teeth on the reflection, <laughs> but it never flew? The engines never started. No one ever got on board. After a while, it'd get pretty discouraging, really, to have this big, monstrosity. In fact, we even have um, names we've created for those things. We say they're white elephants. You know, I've got it. In fact, I used to work for a carpet cleaning company when I was in New York for a short period of time. And at one stage, they created this uh, contraption that was supposed to do everything. You know, it would shampoo them, it would rinse them, and, and do all the rest of it. And it was this great big purple thing, you know. And and, uh, and, and we had it as a window display because it was worthless, really. And everybody referred to it as, the, even though it was purple, they called it the white elephant because it was, they spent all this money on it and then nobody ever used it. But this is, this is the thing God says he doesn't want us to be as a church. God created the church to be an army, not an elephant. He created us to be on the offensive for doing good. And if all we do is spend time dusting up and prettying up and shining up and never doing anything about it, then we aren't fulfilling the purpose God has for us. 
I believe the exercise and the challenge that we need to regularly go through in our lives is to just tap ourselves on the shoulder and ask ourselves the question, what am I doing? What am I doing? What can I do for you, Lord, to complete and, uh, and fulfill your purpose? The reason that you come to church, the reason that you gain more knowledge about what the scripture says isn't just so that you can become more intelligent. It's so that you can become more effective in your ministry for the Lord. So that you can become more uh, encouraged, stimulated, motivated to do what God wants you to do. Because if all you do is come, and I know we have chairs, we don't have pews, but some say, I uh, would come to church and just be a pew warmer, you know, somebody to come and, and occupy a space in the church, then you're not fulfilling the purpose that God has for you. You're not using what God has given you. You have all this weaponry, and the gates of hell stand protected because you've never, ever even tried to push on them. It's heavy duty, I know. But when we look at this laziness, we have to recognize that we are all lazy about some things, but God has, throughout the scripture, admonition for us to not be lazy when it comes to doing his work. My second point, really, is laziness is wastefulness. If we don't use it, we're wasting it. If we consider the gifts that God gave us, or has given us, like bread. I think we, we look at them, uh, gifts that God has given us, like metal or wood, or something that would be much more durable. We consider the gifts that God has given us to be things that will stand the test of time and will we'll hold on to. We don't think of them as being perishable. Because if we considered them to be perishable, we would be much more active about using them, recognizing that the day will come when we won't be able to because they'll be moldy. They'll be off, out of date. But in truth and in reality, there is a part of the gifting God has given us, which is a lot like bread. It is perishable. You have abilities now in your life that one day you will no longer have. I recognize in my own life that there are parts of my uh, physical being that are, uh, they don't function quite as well as they used to. You know, When I was uh, in my more active years, there were parts of me that could you know, endure um, staying up later at night. Now I kind of yawn when it hits about six o'clock. You know? <laughs> I'm ready to bed. I'm ready for bed by half past seven. I'm a zombie by nine, you know. No, not really. I, I can carry out. But truthfully, there were times when, of course, you know, I could stay up. I, I see some of these youth who, who go out partying, you know, and I, I hear about it, and I, you know, they go out to these clubs, these nightclubs, and they listen to music. In fact, I went to a particular uh, concert once, and they had three people on the venue. They had the main group I wanted to hear, and then they had two opening acts. And, uh, of course, they had the first opening act, which is kind of a new, a new newbie person who came on and performed. And they were okay, but, you know, they're going to have a few years to season before they become any good. And then the second group gets up. And they perform, and they're a bit better, you know, because they're closer to the headline act. Did you know the main act didn't even come on until almost midnight? Did you know I went home before the main act even came on? As I was so tired. I thought, oh, what a waste. I should have just slept and gotten up at midnight, you know. <laughs> by the time. But I see some of these youth who will go and do these all-night parties. You know, they're up at 4 in the morning. I think, I can't do that anymore. There was a day when physically I was a bit more capable of staying up late. Like, I can't do that anymore. Need a bit more sleep. <laughs> Making me tired just thinking about it. You know? <laughs> but recognizing that the things about our physical body, which go, that happens with spiritual giftings as well. 
You may have the ability now to do things that you won't one day have. And if you don't lose them, they will get moldy. And one day they will become so stinky that you'll just need to get rid of them. Because I can't, I just can't do that anymore. There was a day maybe I could. And the excuses will no longer work. Look just a few pages over. Let's get back in the Bible. Look at Proverbs chapter 18. Just a few pages over. Proverbs chapter 18. This particular verse, it, it, as you know, the Proverbs often can stand alone. Each verse can stand by itself. And this is one of those verses which is easy uh, to, to stand alone. I'm going to read it to you in the NIV, and then I'm going to read it to you in the King James. Verse 9, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 9. The Bible says, One who is slack in his work is brother to one who destroys. I like the way that King James words it better for this, because it says in the King James, He also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. If you're slothful, you become a great waster just by the nature of the fact that you're not using what, you, uh, what you've been given. <clears throat> it grieved me when I worked in uh, the grocery stores in the days that I used to stock shelves for a period of time. To, to see the bakery guys at night, you know, after the store would close. And they would um, take trolleys and they'd put them uh, in, a, in a kind of a convoy train. They would, you know, rope them all together. And uh, just to be able to put all of the day's uh, baking goods, which were no longer useful, and they'd pile them in these trolleys. And sometimes I'd watch six tro a six-trolley train leave the bakery with baked goods, which were no longer going to be sold and they were going to be destroyed. Um, and I just watched that. And I used to think, ah, oh, how many people that would feed, you know. And, of course, how tempting, because as you watch it pass, uh, most of it isn't gone off yet, but it's close. And you think, that'd make a great dinner for me. You know, <laughs> looking at some of those jam donuts and... And uh, certain cobs, you know, that would keep just real well. And I even had the freezer for space for it, you know. But you watch that stuff go by. And I used to, it used to pain me to see the waste. I know you'd be the same. I went into McDonald's the other day. And uh, it was very funny. But I was, I was there just at the end of breakfast, the beginning of lunch. And I, I thought, oh, I'm going to get, uh, you know, an uh, Egg McMuffin. And a cup of, to go with my cup of coffee. And so I got the meal, you know, and they uh, gave me the hash brown, the little potato and the hash brown. And they passed that over. And I looked over, and of course all the menus now have been flipped over to um, daytime, or to the lunchtime menu. And, and so here sat this whole row of hash browns on the back. And they were out of the breakfast sandwiches. And so I said to them, I just looked at them with a, with a pained expression, what are you going to do with all of those hash rounds that are up there on the top? And uh, they looked over and could see there are no sandwiches for them to go with anymore. And I uh, said, oh, they'll go in the bin unless you'd like to buy one. And I said, no, no, I don't want to buy it. You know, you can give them all to me and I'll find people to eat them, though. You know, that's <laughs> that doesn't work that way. And I didn't expect that. I wasn't trying to get a handout. It just, just seeing waste. There's just something about it that says, ah, oh, we waste so much, so much food that could go other places. And it just, just goes in the bin. It just goes to rot. I wonder, and this is where I bring this illustration, I wonder if God doesn't do that with us. If he doesn't look down from heaven if we can picture God as uh, the, the sovereign looking from his throne and see <laughs> us and say, oh, if they would just use what I gave them. They've only got, their clock is ticking. 
their use by date is going to be passed. And it's going to be too late. They're not going to be able to use it. It will just be wasted. And this is that verse. Proverbs 18, verse 9. Or sorry, uh, Proverbs, yeah, 18, verse 9. One who's slack in his work, slothful in his work, is brother to him that's a great waster. Look at John chapter 9 with me. John chapter 9 will be our last place. There is a teaching in Scripture which applies to all of us. We cannot run from it, nor should we. But there is an admonition which comes from Jesus, which actually was something he worked by. He worked according to it. We often say Jesus set the example for us when he was here on earth. He is somebody we look to and we say, Jesus did this, and this is how we should be. I want to be Christ-like. Look at John chapter 9, and then um, we'll just look at verse 3 and begin there. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. And then he calls attention, verse 4, this is where he calls attention to a small opportunity to teach. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. That's a heavy teaching that he pulls out in John 9, 4. Work while you can, because the night is coming and no one's going to be able to anymore. What's it like when you get to the store and the door is closed? You put off going all day and then you decided to go and then, ah, oh, it's Saturday night. Ah, oh, they close. Oh, no. What's it like when you get there and you realize, I had all of that time. I could have come, but I just remembered. Oh, I forgot they don't stay open 24 hours on Saturday. Oh, I need that get there and we're frustrated. We push on the door and it's locked. Wait a minute. It's never locked. It's never locked. 24-7. I come here anytime. What is this? And we push on the door and it's locked. We say, oh no. What have I done? Small mistake. Tesco's will open at 10 on Sunday morning. <laughs> but what's it like in life? <laughs> If suddenly there you are, and you're lying in the hospital bed, and the doctor says, I'm really sorry, but you're not going home. And you think, oh, no. No, no, there's so much more I've got left to do. Oh, if I'd have thought that I was going to be leaving to come here and I wasn't going to go home. Oh, there's so many things I would have done. You see what I mean? Sorry, but I know people who are like that. It grieves me and it always brings a tear to my eye when I'm sitting with someone and I've had dear friends. I've got stories and so do you of people that you've known who've come to that point. And I remember hearing them say words like, but I've got so much to live for. I don't want to go now. Oh, there's so much more I have to do. Work for the night is coming when no one will be able to work. It's heavy duty, isn't it? Don't be heavy duty lazy. Be heavy duty in your service for the Lord. Let's get it done, amen? Let's pray.